about the Beaker browser. Um, Beaker is a project I've been working on for about six months now. Uh, it's a Chrome fork. And um, the title of my talk is The Distributed Web and the Browser that I Wrote to Surf It. So uh, what is the distributed web? Uh, Kyle mentioned it briefly with IPFS. There's actually a couple of different protocols that are uh, vying for that position, uh, IPFS and DAT. And they're both uh, sort of one-to-one -one replacements with HTTP. Now, a uh, valid question to start out with, what is the distributed web? I kind of put it as a combination of the web and BitTorrent. We take some of the ideas from the BitTorrent protocol integrated into the web. Uh, there are a couple of different uh, principles that this provides us. The first is that anybody can be a server at any time. So uh, my laptop here could potentially become a server, a smartphone could, or a computer in a data center somewhere. Uh, second principle is that there's no binding between a specific uh, computer and a site. The content lives independently. So similar to BitTorrent, you can download a site you can serve it off of uh, your computer after you've downloaded it and rehosted it. So you have a lot more resilience, and this is what Kyle was talking about when we want sites to be able to survive beyond GeoCities going down. Uh, the third principle is that there's absolutely no backend. These sites are basically static file bundles that get downloaded on your computer and then run off of your computer. Um, which actually has a couple of nice um, implications in terms of the features that we're able to provide. So the, all this together gives us a couple of different goodies, nice features that we can implement. The first, and this is possibly my favorite, is we're able to build a fork button directly into the browser. Again, these sites are basically static file bundles, and it costs you absolutely nothing to allocate a new web domain, because what they actually are are public keys. So you mint a new key pair, uh, excuse me, new key pair, and you copy the files into it, and now you're able to modify the, the, the site that you forked it and then deploy those changes in a very smooth fashion. Um, this gives us a situation where people can more or less hack socially. You can get onto an application and decide, you know, I'd like to make a change. You can go ahead and fork it, you can make your changes, and then you can share those changes um, without having to even talk to a host somewhere, because you're just, just going to be able to do it right off of your own computer. Um, and hopefully what that will allow is some of the richness that Kyle's talking about where we can be creative and, uh, like Amber said, weird with the web again. Because we don't have to wait for changes to be percolated down from the top. Instead, users can go to something and say, I'd like something to be different. And they can just make those changes themselves and then share them. So hopefully we can have applications that are built instead of from the top down, from the bottom up. Independent publishing is probably the most important feature of the distributed web, in my opinion. Um, right now, the way things work on the web, whenever you want to say something or publish something, you'll go to like twitter.com, you'll write your tweet, and what you're basically doing is creating a new page on somebody else's site, on the twitter.com site. It's highly dependent publishing. You, uh, you're, you're losing agency over this content. You lose the ability to control how it's presented, um, how it's moderated or monetized. Um, you also lose the uh, control over the content itself, which is a controversy that Reddit recently brought up in the past couple of weeks when the uh, SPES went and changed some of the comments in this website. So um, you, as a user, it's, it's kind of a raw deal. It's not a huge deal for Twitter, but for something like YouTube, it matters quite a bit because content creators are trying to make livings off of, uh, off of YouTube, and they're kind of constantly at odds with, with YouTube. So it's important that we have independent publishing for, the I think, the web to continue to be a force for good. Um, and the distributed web, again, you can allocate a new web domain uh, cheaply. It costs you nothing. So whenever you're publishing, rather than relying on somebody else's service, you can create a new website and write your files into this web domain that you own. Um, not only does that keep you in control of content or data that you publish, but you can also uh, disassociate from the application that you create content with. You know, with Twitter, you're kind of stuck using Twitter, but when you're uh, using um, the distributed web, you can actually switch to another application and continue to interact with that content because the content and the application are completely separated. Uh, this also factors into the, the, the backend um, aspect of things. Since there's no backend, you're still able to use web services. Um, but the sites themselves are offline first, which is to say, in the traditional web, by default, the interaction is you're going to be talking to some remote server somewhere. That's what you expect to do. 
Um, in the distributed web, these are basically static sites that you're downloading and they're completely divorced from a backend. So um, you can ask the, uh, the way it's working in Beaker is we have it sandboxed by default. So a site actually has to ask for permission to use the network and you'll know it when it's happening. So in this model, the default is to have um, the device itself be the authority or where data is kept and then using a remote service is then the exception as opposed to the rule. Uh, this helps a lot also with uh, just how effectively applications work because if the internet goes down um, in the distributed web, you're not actually dependent on a remote host. So you can continue to operate the application. Uh, first of all, it serves off of your own computer, it caches there, so you're able to load the application at all. But then on top of that, if you're using, there are web APIs built into Beaker so that you can publish on these peer-to-peer -peer protocols. So if you're using one of these protocols, you can write files into your own web domains whether or not you have an internet connection. And then once the internet comes up, you'll be able to synchronize with everybody else. So you can kind of think of the distributed web protocols as a giant, eventually consistent system. Yeah? A number of that 96, I mean, I tried to explain the semi-connected internet, but apparently I can't. Yeah. Is this, I mean, you would have loaded some notes. Yeah. You would have notes. I've never used it myself, but okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a function of the fact that you're hosting from your own device, you know. It's not so much a hosting as it's on the local devices and you're reconciling right. your content. Yeah. So it, it, where, it, 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 one way to think about this is that you're not hosting something from the host board as much as your own access sites as you reconcile to your local content. Right. Right. For, for you, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, the model is somewhat similar to something like CouchDB if you've ever used that. Um, and if you want to, the way that the distributed web works, you kind of have one person with authority over a given domain. It's based on whether or not you hold the private key to um, a site, um, which means that we don't actually have the ability for multiple users to write to an, an address at the moment. Um, but in the future, probably CRDTs or different it's sort of. Supposed to a distributed wiki. What's that? It's not a distributed. Wiki. It's it's not a, it's not a wiki. Um, there's the capability to make something like that, perhaps in the future, but that would not be the the thing I would um, focus on now. Um, there are some other interesting properties that we can do with the distributed web, which I'm not going to get into for time reasons. But um, there's some very nice secure distribution uh, factors involved in terms of having content hashes used to verify the integrity of sites as well as um, key pair signatures to ensure that you're getting authentic copy. Um, and one of the pro again, the Beaker browser has two different protocols. One of them even uh, takes some uh, ideas from certificate transparency to ensure that everybody in the network is getting the exact same copy of information. And then there's also some potential to put versions, at, like semantic versions, inside of URLs with some of these protocols, which would be really nice for publishing uh, JavaScript modules. And it's sort of like having your package manager built directly into the web. So why don't I show what the Beaker browser looks like here. Uh, so that's it. It's very traditional looking. It doesn't try to do anything um, surprising with the UI. Can I, can I ask a, just a step backwards question, I'm sorry. Sure. So when you say the distributed web and it's sort of like web plus BitTorrent, you're not actually using the BitTorrent protocol, I assume, or using IPFS, an existing one, or you, have you created your own? It's, yeah, it's not BitTorrent, it's IPFS and okay. DAT are the two different protocols I'm using. Okay. Thank you. Um, both of them are effectively what I would call better BitTorrents. Yeah. They take the same original premises and then build on them to add things like the ability to change an archive once you've published it, which Torrent can't do currently, um, as well as some other uh, security guarantees that are interesting. Thank you. So um, UI is familiar. This is your new tab interface. Um, and the, probably the most important uh, difference is this tab right here, which got some nice test data running around in there. But this is basically all the sites that I'm hosting out of my browser. Um, and I can you know, toggle them on and off and decide if I want them to be uploaded into the, the network or not. And uh, these sites are available for you to kind of browse around in a sort of a GitHub-inspired interface. If readme.md is rendered. And you can see the, the files, the file listing. You can look at the history of the site and see what's changed over time. And then if you want to actually view the content, you can just jump over to the index.html and it behaves. 
as you would expect. So here's my sort of Web 1.0 inspired uh, website. <laughs> Um, so let's see, probably, well I should demonstrate it, I'm going to have to put this down. So I'm going to demonstrate um, publishing uh, a site off of this, so let's make a new directory of Web 1.0. There's a command line tool that I wrote actually this last week that allows me to interact with the site, uh, with, the, with the browser, so it's called BKR, and I can just run an init command. It sort of takes cues off of uh, NPM and Git, sort of tries to merge both of them. So, just... Now there's my new uh, URL that we've allocated. This particular tool is using the DAP protocol, but uh, pretty much everything I'm doing here could also be done with IPFS, and it's just sort of, uh, they're both strong and very similar, so it's kind of not really sure which one's gonna end up winning out, or if they'll both continue to be used. But this is the URL in DAT. It's pretty long. It's a 64-character hex-encoded URL, but it is globally uh, referenceable. What that actually refers to as a public key. So if we look at the site that we just allocated, um, by default it creates a manifest file, the DAT.json manifest file, which is sort of like a package.json. Includes some metadata that we just sort of generated through that init flow. Now, one of the interesting uh, things about these peer-to-peer -peer hypermedia protocols is that. When you download a, a site, you actually don't immediately close off your connection to the swarm. You stay in the swarm and you continue to pull to uh, synchronize in the background. So I have a feature to take advantage of that. A live reloading thing, so we have electricity there to symbolize that we're live reloading. So now I can go ahead and create an index.html. And we're going to publish it as version 1.0.0. Good, and it automatically reloads of course. Um, the automatic reload is kind of cool because you don't actually, you know, usually you have to be on the computer that's doing the, uh, the work to even get something like live reloading, but this works over the network. So um, if you wanted to do like live blogging, for instance, it'd be kind of a cool way to do that. Just turn on live reloading on somebody's site and it'll automatically refresh for you. It's, it's a, just kind of a fun feature we got built in there. Um, when you go to one of these sites, uh, you're able to decide uh, to go look at the files behind it. So you can click on the title here and decide to go see the site files and you'll get that interface that we were looking at before. Uh, here is where that fork button comes into play. So if this were somebody else's site and I wasn't the owner of it, I'd be able to hit the fork button and say, you know, And you'll notice the uh, URL is different because we allocated a whole new site, but we just copied over the files, and now I can go ahead and make my own changes and, um, and reshare them to the world. So um, there's that sort of uh, flexible um, publishing that we were talking about. The final thing worth showing is an application that puts this to work. Now, um, the peer-to-peer -peer protocols are exposed as a web API. So you can uh, see if I can write a command. So there's a command that let me read the file listing inside of the site that I just uh, just forked. So we can see the file listing and then I could call read file or what have you. If you own the site and your application is given permission to do it, you can actually write to the sites um, through web APIs as well. So that's illustrated with this um, application. But before I do that, I should explain what this app is. Um, this is sort of like our little um, distributed web Twitter. Uh, what we have on the, uh, the right side over here are the list of sites that I'm pulling from. And when this application loads up, it will look inside of the log subdirectory of each of these sources and say, are there any .txt files in there? And if there are, it will assemble them into a feed, order them by creation time, and then put the text contents into the, into the feed. So what we're looking at is a bunch of, so here's slash log 2.txt, and here's number 1.txt, so that's sort of a nice little... Um, you know, uh, social blogging thing. So if we wanted to, we could use the web APIs to create our own uh, blog. It's going to ask for permission to create one of these sites. It's going to be writing files, and you don't want it to just be 
steal space from you, disk space, so I'm going to allow it. And there we have it, we've um, posted a log entry. Here's the a link to the uh, that site I just created, and you can look and see, here's the log directory, and there's the .txt file that we created. And that's sort of the basic mechanics of this. So, So that's pretty much um, where Beaker is at right now. It's a, a kind of a good demonstration of all the core principles of it. Um, and, you know, I think that's really about it. So that's the browser I wrote to uh, browse the distributed web. If anybody has any questions. Yeah. Sorry? It's. Um, if you can go through the build process, you probably will succeed in another platform, but I haven't. It's only built for Mac right now. It shouldn't be too much work to get it working on. Yeah, there's actually a bunch of lines on Windows. Okay, yeah. yeah. Like yep. Yeah. Um, let's see if it's working right now. Oh, you know what? I don't have an internet connection, so that may not work. But who knows? Maybe it's cached. Oh, okay. yeah, my MIT guest is a. Uh, that's just a free Wi-Fi spot. And let me just plug it into it. One second. I think that should. Oh, you're not no, you're not paying for that website. What's that? Nobody can afford that website. Uh, the hostless dot website. No, I'm saying you're not going to find that website. I'm not going to find it. Let's find out. This is why offline first matters. There we go. Okay, so yeah, it's um, if you look at the, the dig response here, it's just a TXT record that includes the, the raw link inside of it. Um, IPFS has a similar mechanism where there's a little more syntax to it. Uh, it's a it's a TLD. Yeah. yeah. There's um, I don't talk a lot about the DNS yet because it's not authenticated. There's a security problem. Um, you know, when you're using HTTPS, you get a SSL certificate so that you can authenticate and make sure you're getting the right site. Um, we don't have the equivalent of SSL for it, either IPFS or DAT, so it's not secure to be using these yet. You can trivially, trivially man in the middle, these DNS lookups, um, but they're, they're sort of as a proof of concept for now. It's about as secure as HTTP is in that regard. Anybody else? Cool. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much.